Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we'll welcome everybody. It's lovely to have everybody here for the uh, first event of the year here at the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies, or WCED. I'm, uh, I'm Dan Slater, I'm the director of WCED in my, my second year now doing this. And uh, this is really quite a, a really great occasion for, for me um, to, welcome, uh, to welcome Richard Doner as our first speaker of the year, at our first, uh, first event of the year. Um, as, uh, so Rick is the Goodrich C. White Professor Emeritus, now newly emeritus, uh, in the Department of Political Science at Emory University. Uh, and at Emory is where Rick was my dissertation chair. So that makes it all the more, uh, all, all the more meaningful to have him, uh, to have him here. Uh, Rick has written you know, a lot of books and articles. The, his most recent book, which I think we'll be, we'll be drawing on today, is the, the Politics of Uneven Development, Thailand's Economic Growth in Comparative Perspective. And I think it's sort of fitting to have Rick kick the year off because one, uh, I think one theme that we're going to be doing more of this year, which we've maybe done not quite as much in the past, I think we're going to be thinking and talking a lot more about the, more the economic foundations of, of political regimes, thinking more about what's the you know, economic material terrain on which struggles over democracy versus authoritarianism take place. And really, it's, it's extraordinary to have Rick here as our first speaker on that theme because there's nobody who understands and knows in a really nitty gritty way the way that the economy works uh, than Rick. Um, if you know anything about his, his research, his command of detail, his knowledge of, of the content uh, of economic development in all its, uh, in, in all its nuances is really remarkable. Um, and I was you know, thinking earlier today about this, this cliche that people you know, use about, usually about their senior mentors, and they say, oh, they don't make, they don't make political scientists like, you know, they don't make people like this anymore, right? And I was thinking about this and thinking, you know, they've they actually never made political scientists like Rick. Um, and you know, Rick is someone who came to to study, you know, the auto industry and to you know, study the you know the, the semiconductor industry from a real insider's perspective and someone who really uh, just knew the content. He he knows his stuff in a way that I think is really quite rare and has always, I think, been, been rare in the, in the social sciences. So I think, for me, a lot of the inspiration from, that Rick always gives me is that there's really no substitute for just knowing your, knowing your subject matter backwards, forwards, inside and out. So I think that uh, today in this talk, so Rick will be talking about the politics of the middle income trap, uh, which is a phenomenon which is you know, quite important in a lot of cases that have been struggling to, to try to, to establish, consolidate uh, democracy, including Thailand, uh, for sure. And so I think we'll be learning a lot about those, those details as well as the big picture uh, in Rick's talk. So without further ado, thanks so much for coming, Rick. So I'm supposed to turn this on. OK. Um, thank you, Dan. Thanks, guys, for coming out. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. And, um, so I'm going to be talking about the middle income trap, which my sense is that most of you are not kind of political economists. And so this, this concept may be a little bit uh, foreign to you. And you may be wondering, well, what does this have to do with emerging democracies or lack thereof? And what I hope to show is to give you a sense of why this thing is so important, why it shouldn't be left open to analysis, shouldn't be open, left, left to economists, which it generally has, what political scientists have to contribute to this, um, and its implication, which I think are really quite important for key political phenomena, and especially um, populism and uh, democratic erosion. Um, so I would hope that the discussion goes in that direction, and that um, uh, and if I can inspire anybody, it's. I would hope to inspire you to look at these kinds of phenomenon, economic phenomenon, with, uh, with an eye to what the implications are, as Dan said, for, um, for uh, political phenomenon. Um, and did I not? There it goes. OK, so just briefly, the, the, the middle income trap is this phenomenon in which countries that emerged into um, middle income um, at one point 
are staying there longer than they should have. The assumption is, is that by and large, if you get into middle income, it should take you 14 years, something like that, or 20 years at the most, to move into high income. And what we have here is that, so these are uh, East Asian newly industrialized countries and some others. China is moving up, but these here are the countries that we're talking about pretty much. Countries that have moved into middle income and have basically stayed there. And my example, the case that I'm going to focus on the most, um, is, is Thailand. And the question that I want to address here is why is it a trap? And part of this um, I would hope to get you to think about is what is a trap? I mean, if you're just stuck there for a long time, does that mean you're in a trap? Presumably, a trap is something like a mutually reinforcing equilibrium or something, to use a fancy talk, right? So is that what we're talking about? What's going on here that, the, is this just a, a coincidence? And um, so the background for this is that, and the puzzle of why is a trap and why I don't think economists have looked at this, is the economists generally understand what the problem is. The problem is low productivity. That these are countries that used, that grew a lot based on low, um, uh, low wages and natural resources, right? Their wages are no longer so low. Uh, in Southeast Asia, it varies Thailand and Malaysia at the high end, Indonesia, Philippines at the lower end, but generally these countries are, are moving at the higher wages, and yet they're not yet all that productive. So they're really caught in kind of a nutcracker um, between the lower, the still low wage countries like Indonesia and Vietnam on the one hand and the higher wage but higher productive countries like Korea and Taiwan. So everybody knows it's a productivity problem. Also, there's a consensus on what you should do about it, right? Train, train, train. We need better human resources. You need infrastructure. You need roads, but you also need things like testing uh, centers and things like that. You need research and development. You need intellectual property rights that are better than ever. And you need flexible labor markets. So you read all this stuff, and I want you to, you know, to echo Dan, I want you to keep in mind the middle income trap is a key topic of concern for development economists now. It's not the only one, but it's a big deal. So World Bank is writing this stuff all over the place beginning in about 2005. And people in Southeast Asia pay attention. So Malaysia, Thailand, to some degree Philippines, um, and Indonesia, and increasingly Vietnam. Four years ago I was at a meeting in Hanoi, and the whole point was, is Vietnam moving to a middle income trap? Pretty amazing. Um, so we know it's a productivity problem, we know what you should do to get out of it, everybody's aware of this. And so if you, this is the question, I mean, I started reading this stuff and I thought, well, if you know how to get out of it, why don't you? I mean, everybody knows the policies and you can read all these World Bank and IMF and ADB reports and it says, here's what you do. Um, so why doesn't happen? And in fact, um, as I hear it all talk about, there's really no theory about why and how middle income countries might be different. What is it about them? And in fact, as the people, uh, Homie Gill and, and Karras, who developed the whole idea of the middle income trap in 2005, 10 years later, they said, nobody pays attention to politics. Um, and still, you can go to meetings in which they will talk at, at nauseam about what you should do. And there'll be maybe one political scientist there who raises his or her hand. So the rest of the presentation, I want to kind of explain what or present what our view is of, this, of what's going on. Apply it to Thailand. Think a lot, Thailand, especially in the context of one of the areas that's especially important, and that is technical vocational education and training or career technical education, whatever you want to call it. But first, a couple of assumptions that I want you to be uh, aware of that I operate under. One is that you need, as I mentioned, you need political analysis. The economist wrote, um, Last year, economics should speak with great hum humility about how this structural reform or that tax change might affect long-term growth. They have not earned the right to confidence, and I would say especially with regard to the growth problems. It's much easier in terms of poverty alleviation than it is in, in this, this area. Um, and I would also suggest that we need much greater attention to the demand side, and you'll see what I mean by that. But the key thing is, what do firms want? What do they need? Because firms are what we're talking about. 
firm performance is key. So what do they need? How do those demands and pressures affect what political elites, who, who are really key in this story, um, what they do? And then, so after you understand the demand side, then you could move to the supply side. But if you read through all these reports, they say, we need bureaucratic reform. We need this reform in, this, in, in the institutions. I'm all about institutions, but you have to understand where they come from. So here's the basic argument. Um, the first part is that different stages of growth require different kinds of policies. So moving from low to middle income really is a question of diversifying your economy. And Thailand has done that brilliantly. Um, how do you move from agriculture to industry? How do you diversify agriculture? How do you diversify industry, increase exports? And that's really a function um, of mobilizing and allocating factors of production, especially capital and labor. Um, it's, to, to, to use the economy, it's, it's investment driven. It's investment driven. And it involves property rights, macroeconomic stability, basic infrastructure. When we talk about um, moving from middle to high income, we're talking about productivity and competitiveness in increases. Um, we're talking about, some of you may be uh, acquainted with the idea of total factor productivity. And total TFP basically is how much more you get after you, you, you include increasing levels of land, capital, and labor, right? And there you require research and development, education, technical training, all the stuff that we've talked about. So the first thing is not all policies are the same. It may seem obvious, but you will, not, you will find very rarely um, uh, acknowledgement and a discussion of that point. A related point is that when you have that, that the movement, the policies required to go into higher income are, in my uh, view, institutionally more difficult to carry out. Um, they require stronger institutions, different institutions. But institutions don't create themselves. And they, don't, rare, they rarely emerge simply out of the magic of the market, um, the way um, uh, sometimes you're taught in economics uh, departments. So how do you get strong institutions? Our argument is that typically you need, you need coalitions. You need pressure. Um, you need pressure from below in many cases, from business and labor. And in many cases you need pressure from above, um, an existential threat of various sorts that leads political uh, elites to create new coalitions. So coalitions can come from top or they can come from bottom. So first point, different stages of development require different policies. Different policies are differentially difficult. Um, strong institutions require coalitional support, whether it comes from below or above. And our argument is in, in middle income countries, these coalitions are difficult to create because of what we call disarticulation politics. And some of you may have heard this term disarticulation. If anybody studied, ever studies dependency theory anymore, I'm not sure if that's ever in anything, but dependency theorists used to talk about the way in which being in the globalized community meant that rather than have cohesive uh, nature among, co cohesion among different economic actors, they were split. That's what our argument is that coalitions in middle income countries are, diffi are, are difficult due to social and therefore political fragmentation. And one term that you could think of is that middle income countries have grown into trouble. It's the, it's the term, it was the, it's the, um, the title of a chapter in a book about Indonesia. But this idea of growing into trouble is one that I wanna leave you with. And here is kind of the, uh, kind of a, you know, a simple schematic. And there, the idea is that the growth into the middle income involves political conditions that generate low demand and supply for upgrading institutions. And I'll mention what institutions I'm talking about. And yet, at the same time, the growth into middle income, um, if you're going to move beyond that, you need policy policies that require new, stronger institutional capacity. So there's a mismatch between the results of moving into middle income and the need or the, the requirements of moving into high income. 
and I'm going to argue that this has important political, uh, political repercussions. Um, focus a little bit on education and training. Okay, um, presumably, I don't think anybody here is all that you know, focused on this. This is an important thing. It's an important country f issue for the, for the United States, but more and more for countries, in, uh, for any country, but especially those in, in middle income. Um, and what you see here is just some aggregate statistics about comparing um, uh, the mid large middle income countries that I'm interested in on PISA scores, and PISA, as you, some of you know, are uh, these international performance tests. Number of people, proportion of people in secondary vocational enrollment, labor force, R&D personnel, and what you see here is compared to the recent high income East Asia countries, um, the countries like Thailand and Malaysia are quite low and even lower than uh, high income OECD um, countries. And just to, the ADB did a, uh, did ran some numbers with regard to a simulation with regard to the impact of a 20% increase in um, human capital spending. And so this simply shows that it the generally it reduces inequality by the that is the Gini coefficient and increases productivity. And these these um, these percentages may not seem a lot, but they're quite important. Okay, so just to make the argument that technical vocational training is quite important in terms of sustainable growth. But, and this gets referring back to the point I made before, reforming vocational training is difficult. And what I want you to think about is what it's like to reform, to develop a vocational training system compared to building a school. Building a school is bricks and mortar. So I would suggest that if you're, if you're interested in why one policy is more difficult to implement, you think about these kinds of dimensions of difficulty. One is reforming an educational system takes a long time. The benefits are not clear for quite some time. And think about what that means with regard to how it jives with the incentives of political leaders who generally have relatively short time horizons whether they're authoritarian or not, okay? Um, typically, and if you think about in uh, countries with relatively um, frequent turnover, how, if you're gonna have frequent turnover in leadership, whether it's cabinets or coalitions or whatever it is, how are you gonna sustain a, uh, a policy, support for a policy that takes so long to implement? And we're gonna talk about the case in Thailand. The second dimension is it's not very visible. How do you know when you've had, you know, how, how can you actually point to? Eventually you can say, well, we've got better, uh, better test scores, but that takes time, right? And it's not as obvious as bricks and mortar, okay? A lot of actors are required to implement these things. Um, and what I would like you to do is to, think, is to compare this with things like Devaluing, ex devaluing an exchange rate, which are essentially stroke of a pen things, right? They're done right away, central bankers do it, and then they kind of implement themselves. Um, you're, edu you're, you're doing a reform of, a, of an educational system. You're talking about everything from soup to nuts. It requires coordination among companies who have to decide what kind of education do we need um, and links between them and the private sector. First of all, how do you get firms to cooperate? Not obvious, not obvious. You require horizontal cooperation across ministries, and you require vertical cooperation um, uh, within ministries or agencies from the top official down to what are called street level bureaucrats or teachers or instructors, right? How do you make sure that those guys do what the policy actually says? Implementation is tremendously challenging. Um, they're information intensive. How do you know what a good um, uh, education reform policy is for Thailand as opposed to Singapore, as opposed to Malaysia, right? There's no template for this stuff, whereas going back to the macroeconomic policy and exchange rate, generally we know what the technology of the exchange rate is. You know how to do it. You have to be careful of overshooting or undershooting, but you know what to do. That's not the case. Um, in, um, for vocational training. And let me give you just a, an example 
Years ago, colleagues and I were doing, working on a book on the disk drive industry, of all things. And the question was why the disk drive industry moved to Southeast Asia, and especially Singapore and Penang, and what the Thais had learned about this, why the Thais didn't develop as fast as Penang. And we had a discussion with um, an official from the Board of Investments. And he said, you know, you know, we're very aware of what Singapore did, and we wanted to learn from them in terms of how they trained their people with regard to um, um, magnetic storage, which is disk drives. And so we went, we had discussions, and we downloaded everything that they did, and we saw, and we wrote a big report about, here's what Singapore did, here's what Thailand should do about training. It was training technicians, not necessarily engineers, because that's the need. And so we said, so, you know, did, was it useful? Did it work? And he, you know, did, you, did people learn from me? He said, well, let me show you where, where it is. And he went to his office and he got these two big volumes and he said, there it is. It's never gone anyplace. Why did it no longer go, did it not go anyplace? Because of changes in the leadership uh, um, in the prime minister's office that, that, let, that ran the BOI. Um, but the point was, just because it worked in Singapore does not mean it's going to work other places. And then finally, there's going to be winners and losers of various types, okay? So these, as far as I'm concerned, are really key to understanding why. These are the ways to kind of decipher and categorize and typologize different kinds of policies. So what institutions am I talking about that are supposed to carry out these things? Well, there's public things, there's private. Um, and so all of these are really, if you think, if you care about economic development by middle-income countries, you gotta pay attention to these guys. And you have to see how co cohesive are they, how expert are they, how much, uh, how much turnover do they have in their staff. Um, and frankly, I, my own, for my own money, this is really some of the most interesting stuff that you can get because if you care about, as Dan said, the nitty gritty of development, this is where it happens. But it happens not just because of culture, not because people are dumb or anything like that. Our argument is that these things don't work that well because institutional development, the development of institutions that are capable of doing, uh, of addressing these things, are difficult. Usually think institutions, the way we're taught, the way I was taught, institutions resolve collective action problems. What Robert Bates emphasized is that institutions are collective action problems. Just making them is really tough, or making good ones. You can set up an organization. So the point here is, is that institutions, good institutions typically require some coalitional basis. Um, and the World Bank folks recognize this point. The most productive thing you can do is bipartisan political consensus, um, pro-reform alliances. So if you read all this stuff, you, what you find in these reports is, and it's from the Thai government, all this other stuff too, we need to do this, this, and this in policy, and by the way, we need uh, these consensus. Well, how do you get that consensus? How do you get that coalition? So that's where the importance of coalition comes in, because coalitions, if they're strong, help you to establish intertemporal bargains, that is, bargains that last over time and that provide actors with the necessary information to implement these, what are really quite difficult policies. And so, just so you know that historically we know that productive, uh, high productivity countries with good um, vocational training typically came from places where there were um, varying levels of coalitional uh, uh, coordination. And these are just some of them. So, if, if you buy that, if you buy that coalitions of various societal groups are important to create the institutions that are necessary to implement the tough policies, then what's going on in middle-income countries like Thailand? Why is this, not, why is this a problem? And our, um, our argument essentially is that the key problem is societal cleavages of different kinds. And I would emphasize that these cleavages have emerged in part as a result of growth into middle income and in some ways they contributed to growth, not all. So one level um, cleavage is the whole, the whole society. There's high levels of inequality. And we know that 
inequality inhibits cooperation. We know or we believe that inequality typically leads elites to create institutions that benefit them and not the whole country. The labor market splits between formal and informal workers undermines the capacity to create any kind of cohesive push by labor. They have different preferences. They're different businesses fragmented as well along uh, multinational corporations versus domestic groups and big groups versus and big local groups versus small firms. And the point here is that they have divergent needs for vocational training for R&D, right? And they have divergent capacities for political engagement. Typically, small and medium-sized firms have a hard time collectively organizing and press pressuring. And then all of this has important political impacts. Um, it discourages cohesive in interest groups. It discourages institutionalized encompassing parties. And it leads to vulnerability to clientelism and populism. And so let me, let me speak briefly to what, whether we see this in Thailand. Argu my argument is that this helps explain it. I should mention that a lot of what I'm talking about um, draws on my work with uh, Ben Schneider from MIT and um, the main, one of the main places that we've, the first places that we publish this stuff in is a World Politics article in 2016, but um, this last year we published a th uh, thing on um, an article in Journal of Development Studies, and there's some other stuff in the works. So everybody, it's well known that Thailand lacks skills. Uh, I'm just giving you some, um, some, some quotations. Um, and ironically, some of the major areas of skills uh, shortages are in the areas that are really the, the great champions of Thai manufacturing, automotive, and uh, elect electrical electronics. So Thailand is, one, is the leading producer of hard drives. It's the largest producer of one-ton pickup trucks in the world. It's a big deal, right? Um, and all of this has led, um, the, as far as I'm concerned, the leading researcher on this question on innovation systems, uh, Patra Pong. He wrote a book called Mismanaging Innovation Systems. Okay, so let's look at the Thai development model a little bit. This place is really an impressive in, in a lot of ways. 40% of the population have moved out of poverty within one generation. Hugely diversified. Most developing countries would give their eye teeth to be able to be anything like this. But, sorry about that. Um, the, we know that the problem is, and this is a generally again, well acknowledged that this mainly derives from cheap labor and I would add natural resources. And increasingly, Thailand is, is, is reliant on migrant labor. Um, so Thailand is developed without its own technological capacity. It suppresses labor. Um, and this essentially is a case of shallow, what people call shallow industrialization. And what that means is there are really no Thai firms that, no, there are few Thai firms that have the capacity to engage in process and product innovation that are efficient at the at global level. And the institutions, not surprisingly, um, have been relatively weak, ineffective. And in, so I don't think, are there any Thai, Thais or Thai experts here? Most Thais know that there's an informal classification system for Thai ministries, um, A, B, C, um, and that's based not on effectiveness, but on how much money you can make out of it. Education ministry has typically been an A minus or B plus, meaning you can make money out of education. How? By things like getting the contract for milk or school, you know, books or things like that, or who's going to build the things. The Ministry of Labor um, and Social Welfare, its main area of relevance for us is the Department of Employment. And the official name is Grom Hang Ngan, that is the department where you, for looking for work. Informally, it's known as Grom Hang Ngan, the department where you look for money. Um, because you can make a lot of money working with contractors, uh, migrants, uh, migrant laborers. So a lot of instability. The Ministry of Education had different ministers. The head of the Thai automotive industry, which is a sectoral institute that's supposed to be good at doing this stuff, 
complained that he had to work with 14 different ministers in 11 years. So imagine what it is to try to acquaint a different minister every year with what is supposed to be a long-term plan, um, for especially pl for plans like vocational training. And you don't make that much money out of vocational training, so why should somebody care about it? Um, a lot of reshuffles, even in the military government that was just supposedly changed in the recent elections. Um, there have been some recent reform efforts. So, so my argument here then, I'm basically going back and saying, okay, poor performance on vocational training, lousy institutions, do they correlate with the kind of uh, social cleavages that I talked about before? Um, inequality is clearly there. Um, the Gini coefficient, which is, as you all probably know, the higher the Gini coefficient, the more unequal it is, um, ha improved slightly in terms of consumption but, uh, in 2012, but household income Gini, uh, in, um, got worse. Um, there's a lot of cross regional inequality. Bisan, the Northeast, is ex especially poor. And recently, last year, um, the big news was that Thailand was ranked as number one most unequal country in the world with regard to wealth. So I just want you to, just as a quick question, how would you explain the difference, the disjuncture between not so awful uh, Gini coefficient uh, inequality on consumption versus income? Any ideas? How could you have a country where inequality is, is better for consumption than it is for income. Wouldn't you assume that the two, any ideas? Borrow, debt. So Thailand has one of the highest levels of indebtedness um, in the world. So it shows you kind of how the government is trying to deal with this, mainly by providing all kinds of, of things, um, all kinds of opportunities for, for loans. Okay, inequality, labor fragmentation. I argued that this is an important thing. We see this a lot in Thailand. Um, there are different views as to what the levels of informality are depending on how you, but it's generally at least 50%. 50% of the workforce is informal, that is, it doesn't draw on Social Security, it doesn't pay taxes, um, they work for themselves, etc. cetera. Um, and there are no economists here, so I won't get into the Lewis turning point, which may be. Um, but also, unionization rates stink, under 2%. So basically, the point here is, is that you have two problems. One is, even for, for those who care about this, there's very low unionization rates, so how are you going to make your, your voices felt? But the main thing is insider-outsider split on training. And this is now a literature that's well known in the West, um, and that is insiders, if you have a regular, if you have a job in a, con in a, in a company, informal, you're going to prefer in-house in training. If you're an outsider, you're going to pre prefer these um, active labor market policies like public em employment. So there's a big split in terms of what people want, what workers want, and the ability to actually get any of this. And finally, business fragmentation. So Thai business frag business is split between large and small. It's dichotomous in nature, um, as you see here. Foreign, big versus small, foreign versus local. There are rich ties, there are very rich ties, as obviously you could imagine from this wealth inequality. Uh, but typically they're based on natural comparative advantages in services that typically um, ties have a, uh, an advantage in natural resources. Some autos, no big ones in electrical and um, electrical engineer and electronics. So um, if you look, so Forbes every year has the richest, a list of the richest people in X country. And so what you see here is that there's not many uh, ties, rich ties who are involved in um, manufacturing. Um, Jaron Popan in food, so to the extent that it's manufacturing, it's typically in natural resource processing. Of course, we have Red Bull, that's very important. Um, um, some petrochemicals, um, and then there's some auto parts, but with uh, some other ones, but auto parts are the only ones that are really straight manufacturing. 
And some of you may have, uh, I'm not sure if anybody recognized that last name. There's no Thai people, but that is the family of Tanatong, who is the leader of the new uh, Future Forward Party, which is making quite a lot of noise. Um, sorry. So the assumption here is when you have disarticulated politics, you're going to have lousy interest groups. This is something that Donnie Roderick, uh, a very smart development economist, talked about. And that is that disarticulation means everybody split. There's no basis for pressure on elites to do the developmentally right thing. Okay, And so here's specifically what we're talking about in Thailand. First, we predict that there's weak interest groups. And indeed, that's what you find. Thai, um, there's a lack of strong and varied interest groups. Very important. Interest articulation, I'm using political science terms here, parties. The party system is weakly institutionalized and it's based more on access to lucrative control of ministries than anything else. And that parties are faction ridden, unstable, largely uninterested in policy and detached from broad social groups. This of course is the work of um, our colleague Alan Hicken. And so the result here is populism or one of the results and Dan has written about this. And for my money, one of the best quotations is from two Thai uh, political economists that populism reflects a weak and embattled domestic capitalist class, small and politically marginalized working class, a lot of in informal. That kind of sums it up. Okay. So if you care about populism, this is one way to approach it. Um, and what that means, typically populism, one of the hallmarks is a lack uh, of investment in long-term efficiency as opposed to short-term payoffs. Um, now, I was at a meeting with Pasuk and Baker several years ago, and their argument was, this is a problem, but it's temporary. All countries go through this, that institutions have a long, it usually there's a lag between when, inst when new social forces come up and institutions develop to, to reflect them. I don't believe it at least, and, and my argument is that today's middle income countries are different than past. They're referring to Western countries, maybe to Korea and Taiwan. That's not what's going on here. Um, internally, they are fragmented, as I've emphasized, but something I haven't mentioned here is externally. They face much tougher, tougher ex um, external challenges. They're global value chains that are much more demanding on domestic firms. Um, there's less pr opportunity to protect those firms. There's this idea of premature industrialization, which means that you shift out of manufacturing when the country's people are poorer than has historically been the case of moving um, out of manufacturing. And so that leaves open services. Can services generate the, need, the demand for jobs and the demand for skills? There's, a, there's reason for skepticism. And overall, there's low pressure on political leaders. And so this is a quote from uh, the United, United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. And they're simply saying Thai, firm, Thai political leaders haven't really been pushed that hard for various reasons. And I've gone uh, back and tried to look at precisely what happened in various um, situations where elites were under pressure and each in each case, in, at least in the three important cases, they were, quote, rescued by, you could devalue, you got money from, some, from external, um, you could use the rural area as a place where unemployed people could, could go back and make a living or at least be with, you know, have a home. Um, migrants made a big difference. So all of these things have helped Thailand escape from real tremendous crisis. And just give you one example, um, in some of you may have heard, the 1997 Asian financial crisis was huge. Major poverty increases in Thailand all over the region. And in response, the Thai political elite said, we have to improve our productivity. And they initiated a, something called the um, industrial restructuring plan that involved everybody coming together thousands of hours of discussion about things like vocational training and R&D. And it, it yielded a lot of interesting ideas. Um, um, and then the country devalued. 
and its exports took off. And talks with the, the former the prime minister basically dropped it. You didn't need it anymore because you got out of it through devaluation. So let me conclude here a little bit about what's, what are the future prospects. There's bad news and good news, and then half-assed news, I'm not sure what you would say. Um, bad news is that wage rates have increased a lot. They've doubled um, between, over the last, uh, with the first part of the thousands. Um, migrant labor is still really important. Estimated five million, it may be too high, but certainly four million people of whom a minority are registered. So these are illegals. Um, more and more tendencies toward populism. So I've been studying the rubber industry for several years and there's, like the rice industry, the tendency is when prices go down, these rubber farmers really uh, protest. Um, and instead of figuring out ways that you could avoid exporting that rubber and using it domestically, the country simply uh, gives subsidies for the policies, which is not sustainable. Um, and now, coalitional chess. So as you may know, the new government is composed of 18 parties, and there's a big push for um, uh, control of these different ministries. The good news is that there are these public-private initiatives, but they've been there before. Um, for the first time two years ago, the Board of Investment said, we are going to bring in foreign investment, we're going to attract it, and we're going to make it conditional. We're going to give you incentives if you train, if you promote spillovers, if you share technology. Uh, we can talk about this, but it's very difficult to implement that. But at least but think of it, this country has been industrializing for 30, 40 years, and only now is it coming up with the incentives to promote technology spillovers to local firms that Singapore has been doing forever, forever. Um, and then there's some new institutes that have been developed. Uh, they developed a new Ministry of Science, Innovation, and Higher Education. We'll see if anything happens to that. One other point. Some of you may have heard of the Eastern Economic Corridor, $45 billion is going to move Thailand to become Thailand 4.0, smart Thailand, AI, everything, right? And so, you know, the idea was Thailand has been through these and now, the, now they're at 4.0. Move through agriculture, light industry, at least they're thinking about this, right? And the idea is that you focus on these S-curve industry, robotics, biofuels, healthcare and logistics. So they're really thinking about it and they're putting a whole lot of money into these three um, provinces, Ch Chacheng Sao, Chonburi and Rayong. Huge amounts of money, a lot of infrastructure, bringing in all these firms, um, a lot of foreign firms, a lot of Chinese firms. Chinese are jumping on this. Every time you look at this, Alibaba is in the news. Um, and there's, I won't go into it, but there's a lot of questions about whether this stuff is going to work in any place except logistics. And here's the problem with this thing. And I, I want to emphasize, if you go, if you Google this, you will see the coolest videos about what the EEC is going to do for Thailand. It's just, I mean, they're great at marketing, great at branding. But keep in mind that Thailand has had industrial estates before. And they always said, well, this is great. We have these automobile firms and the suppliers together, and that's all good. You know, everybody learns. World Bank went and did an assessment and said, these are really logistical ex um, arrangements designed to serve reducing transaction cost of sharing rather than promoting spillovers. And the question is whether the EC will be any different. Um, will there be spillovers from multinationals? I have questions. They're planning to train like 50,000 new technicians. Uh, where are the trainers going to come from? Is business going to be involved? I don't know. And so the political danger here is that Thailand is becoming a three-nation economy. There'll be the EEC, there'll be Bangkok, and there'll be the rest of the country. And so that's um, a danger. Um, I'm going to stop there. There's conclusions um, that I could go into, but let me just stop there. I've gone on long enough. So questions, comments, anything? I know a lot, again, I know most of you do not work in political economy and are not Thai specialists. So I'm especially interested in your take, uh, your questions about what are the political implications, unless you want to get into the nitty gritty of, um, of, of economic policy. So I have a microphone.
Thanks. So I'm going to pass around the microphone so you can raise your hand. I'll come to you and then just give a brief introduction and then pose your question. Hi, uh, I'm Matthew. I'm one of the new WCED postdocs. Um, so I have two kind of clarification questions. I know we're not, I'm, I'm definitely not an economist, so I think this will help me think through some sure. of the political implications. So the first is just very simple. How do we know that these countries are taking too long? You said that there's some 14 or at most 20 year benchmark. Can you just give a little bit more background onto where those numbers come from? Uh, they, in part, they come from historical, from recent history. And so one argument is that, that recent history is not a good enough indicator that when you look at the East Asian newly industrialized countries, that's not really a good benchmark. Um, uh, I would accept that to some degree and still say it looks like they're not moving, right? You don't see any, any sense of their movement. So you may not uh, accept the 14 or 20 year um, requirement, but you should see some movement. And you see movement, but it's, it tends to be um, temporary. It tends to be volatile. So they, they seem stuck. So, so I should understand this lack of development as very striking, like very off Right, path. compared to recent policy, yeah. to re recent development, yeah. Okay, so that's the first question. The second one's a bit more involved. So it's and let me just raise here that the significance of this for human development is quite important. This is not, the implication is this is not just about, well, are you going to make it above $12,000, 10 or $12,000, which is the, the crossover point, that this has major implications for uh, equality, for how many, who gets what kind of jobs and for social stability. Okay, so the, the second question is that it seems like the key link in your theory here is that politicians are disincentivized to pursue policies that everybody understands. Well, maybe there's disagreement on exactly the type of policies, right. but the general basket of policies that everybody understands makes sense to fix this. Uh, and so you give a bunch of reasons why politicians might not want to do those things, uh, but I wonder if you can articulate which is doing the most work. So uh, real quick, in mm -hmm. my mind it seems like this like what stood out to me was this heavy reliance on informal labor. Mm -hmm. uh, that seems really important, although it's probably also endogenous to what the politicians are choosing to, to do. Uh, so I guess uh, I don't really know enough about uh, economics to understand what that means. So can you give a bit of background on how countries have historically dealt on this distinction between formal and informal labor? What should this transition look like kind of in the ideal world? Right, in the ideal world, so this gets back to this thing called the Lewis turning point, which I won't bore you with too much of the, of the details, but the way neoclassical economists used to think about this, and this was, again, based on prior experience, it was that basically development happened. There were two sectors in an economy, and development happened, especially people became more productive, wages rose, et cetera. More investment in training. Um, what start, the, 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 the first part was, little by little, people uh, came from the farms, from the the informal se agricultural rural sector migrated to the cities where there was a demand for labor in factories in manufacturing right and they were in formal employment right as that process progressed uh, people the, the the supply of workers from the farms lessened and as that happened there was less supply of less over um, surplus of workers in manufacturing. And so when there was um, higher demand and lower, lower supply of workers, the pressure was on employers to raise wages, to get workers. And if you raise wages, then the assumption was to justify that, you to, to, to justify higher wages, you had to have higher productivity. How do you have higher productivity? You invest in training. That's called the Lewis turning point. And so you'll find these, um, these, these uh, articles that are real quite interesting and when is X going to meet, go to the Lewis turning point? We're waiting for the Lewis turning point. It hasn't happened yet. There is an, uh, a very interesting literature on China and some people argue that China has, has crossed, has begun to cross the Lewis turning point because of labor shortages. There's an investment. I don't know the, I don't know the specifics of that, whether it has or not, but I know people think that more, that there was this, that there, it's more applicable, whereas it hasn't happened in Thailand. So what happens to workers? Typically, um, they will go in and they will go to the countryside, and um, they'll go to the cities, and they may get hired in factories, but typically a lot of the factory labor is contract workers, con temporary workers, right? A lot of people are in contract. Um, and 
I spent a lot of time in one factory. I've been going there for 30 years. And when I first started going, they were very proud that they were unionized, that there was very low rate turnover. After 1997, I went back and they said, well, you know, um, we're going to have to do more contract workers, use more. Why? Because we can't take another, uh, another crisis. We have to be able to lay people off. Otherwise, we're screwed, right? So a volatile market led them to increase their reliance on contract workers. I go back five years ago and I said, well, um, turns out that 40% of their workers are migrant. I was shocked. One firm over, say, 30 years changed. And the whole point was, how do we make sure that labor is, a var is variable capital that we can get rid of in times of difficulty? Because we don't know what our, 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 our orders are going to be. So they'll go and they'll get contract, or when there's a downturn, um, this is the idea of the rural areas of labor, what's called a labor sink, is you might think, oh, if, if there's a downturn, you have these masses of workers who don't have any, don't have any employment, who are suffering, they're going to rise up. They'll organize, whatever it might be. They go back home. They go back home, right? Where you can still do okay, you can, make, you can, you can live, um, in part because of the populist policies of supporting rice and rubber and things like that. So, you know, you go to any, I mean, this is, ask Dr. Hicken, you know, you go to talk to any taxi driver. 90% are from the Northeast. Do you have a farm? Oh yeah, we go back all the time, right? I used to work in this firm, but it, was, it wasn't, wasn't reliable work, so now I drive a taxi, maybe I'll go back to the firm. But when things get bad, I go back up and I've got, you know, 10 rye of, of rice or rubber or something like that. And the government will bail these people out. So these populist policies are reinforcing that, right? So in the past, the Lewis Turning Point worked. People did go in, but there wasn't this reliance on contract workers nearly as much as there is now. And for many places, you couldn't go back home. You couldn't go back to them. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. But you know, the broader question you raised is, how important is this relative to the other ones? I have certainly not figured out an equation or an algorithm to say this, this counts. I just, we believe there's a correlation here and I think it's causal. Okay. Um, so I had a few questions. One is that you showed um, a list of like the top 50 domestic investors right. or domestic firms. The, the richest people. And right. I'm curious, um, what percentage of those firms are, are involved in, in, in politics? And if there is a lot of crossover, I is that helpful or harmful to the business climate um, in Thailand? I mean, there's been kind of mixed um, findings on you know, the degree of linkage between business and politics in middle-income countries. And then a uh, kind of related question has to do with your um, reference to business fragmentation. Um, you, I, you mentioned there's fragmentation between like small and large business and foreign and domestic. And you know, at what point do you say business is, is fragmented? I mean, do you have some kind of measure uh, that you apply to say, okay, this is clearly a, a fragmented case. Right, right. And those are key questions, They're absolutely key questions. So one of it has to do with, um, I would say, interest, the second question has to do with interest articulation. In other words, do you find cohesive business groups um, as interest groups? And the second has to do with party institutionalization. Okay. So uh, the second one first. One of the questions that we ask all the time is, to members of business associations, the Federation of Thai Industry, Thai Chamber of Commerce, um, is who comes to meetings? I mean, it's this kind of hokey indicator, but it really works. It really works. And typically what you find is that, yeah, the multinationals send people to meetings, but it's always underlings, and they're mainly going to see what's going on. They don't provide resources. They don't push for this. Um, that what we have to do with our the small guys, we belong to these groups, uh, but the big guys are not in this, or they're not in it effectively. 
Um, why, how do they make themselves felt? Two ways. One, to some degree, is through the, the foreign chambers of commerce, American or German chambers of commerce, um, where generally those kinds of chambers make a kind of broad, like tax or property rights or better infrastructure. Um, but only in rare cases, and recently rare cases, have I seen, for example, the German Chamber of Commerce saying, we're not going to stick around very long, or we're going to have real problems if you don't start investing in vocational training. We need technicians. We don't need so many engineers. We need technicians. That's what we need. But more and more, you know, when we ask, um, and so I'll give you another example. Um, I studied the rubber industry and compared it with Malaysia. So the big Malaysia is, I'm sure all of you know, Malaysia is the world largest producer of medical gloves. It's absolutely a champion. Those guys, and it's local firms. It's, it's Malaysian, Malaysian Chinese firms, pretty much. But they are spectacular. Um, and they innovate a lot. And they have a very powerful uh, business association, the, the Malaysian Glove Manufacturers. You go to their meetings, it's like, it's huge, huge. Um, everybody goes, and these are, they, run the, they run the show, right? Um, and the government listens to them. They're engaged in constant negotiation. Um, we have talked to people in the Thai Rubber Gloves Association, and they can't get it going because it's basically the multinationals who are, who are producing gloves, condoms, and tires, right? So those are, and keep in mind, Thailand is the largest exporter of natural rubber in the world. And they're huge in terms of rubber gloves and condoms and stuff, but it's foreign dominated. So you look at who is in the, uh, in the business associations. Then the question is, well, what does that mean for business and politics? Because ideally, as the Donnie Roderick quote showed, what you want is have cohesive associations, unions, associations, influencing parties, in negotiations with parties all the time. You don't find that very much. So uh, first of all, the, the Thai entrepreneurs are very wary of getting involved with any parties because what's the party going to be tomorrow um, compared to what it is today? And parties generally, as, the, as Alan Hicken has shown, are really a group of groups of factions, essentially. They are typically, and the new Future Forward Party may be different, but they're not that policy focused, unless it is to get subsidies for the southern farmer, something like that. So there's no program, and, they're, and, the, and the firms are scared to get really their hands dirty with these guys, because they don't know who's going to be who in what ministry. So don't get involved at all. Um, what does that mean for multinationals? How do they get their way? They have direct access to either through the board of investment or, um, or direct as big, they're big firms, right? So Toyota, Toyota could go in and talk to the Minister of Industry. So it's particularistic as opposed to organized cohesive business. Firms do it themselves. Sometimes all the Japanese get together. But you don't have the Japanese with the Americans, with the Chinese very much, and certainly, but just rarely, you, a little bit, but not much. Yeah. Um, I have two questions. The first is less nitty gritty, but it <laughs> relates to what you were just talking about. So, um, and I'm sure you've asked, being asked this question before, so I just wanna hear your thoughts on this. Um, so your analysis relies on country as the unit of analysis. Mm -hmm. Um, but if we think of the international economic system as the unit of analysis, um, then the middle income trap is not necessarily a trap, uh, but an essential part of the international economic system. Um, so I just wanted to hear um, your thoughts on this. And, and, and can you give us a example, for instance, of a high income country that was once upon a time like Thailand now, um, and then how have they escaped the middle so uh, I'm, I'm the, the not trap. so I'm not clear on your first question uh -huh. you mean uh, so could you clear I, I'm sorry so I if we think of the world systems theory uh -huh. um, then you know the the middle income trap is not everybody essentially gets to the high income part right there's always have to be a middle or low in income part for there to be a high income part uh, in the first place so it, it it relies on the system as the unit of analysis. 
um, and, 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 and I don't, I know that people have strong, you know, feelings on these things. I just don't know uh, so where what, you... So give me a sense of what you uh, would expect if you're using the world systems as a unit of analysis. Would you, yeah. how does it relate to what you would expect? Uh -huh. What would the so, hypothesis be in terms of this group? And keep in mind that these countries, the 13, I mean, we looked at 13 fairly large, mm -hmm. middle and large population. There's a lot of folks in, in this. So this mm -hmm. is Brazil, Argentina, Venezuela, mm -hmm. as well as Thailand, Malaysia, mm -hmm. and Indonesia as well. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, so one way, um, I don't know how, say, Wallerstein would have explained uh -huh. this, but if we were to think about um, international investment and whom you open the market to and who you support, who you give the technology to, and then who um, you open your um, uh, market to, right? So if we think of the success cases of escaping the trap, uh -huh. in particular in East Asia and Eastern Europe, then they did have the access to the market and technology right. in the US and the Western Europe. So that's one way of thinking about it, not necessarily right. how everybody would think about no, this. No, I think that's important. And, and one of the points that I made, and I'm sorry, did you want to follow up on this? Because yeah, sure. <laughs> well, let me just answer the question and see I if that helps. No, that's fine. So notice that one of the things that I mentioned was that the middle-income countries of today face different external conditions than the ones of 40 years ago, um, especially in terms of the emergence of global value chains and the, um, what people have now talked about compressed development, is that you've got to get quick. Whereas if you think about the Koreans and the Chinese uh, and the Taiwanese, they had several decades of decent protection, whereas you can't be protected anymore. Um, and they were able to develop industries kind of from soup to nuts, from upstream to downstream to some degree. Now it's very difficult to do that, right? If you can get in a niche, in a niche, that's, that's the best that you can do. And that's the argument is that you take advantage of, of, of global value chains. So it's much more demanding, much more difficult than it was before. That said, I've looked at, for example, there are certain sectors where I thought the Thais or the Malaysians ought to be able to do okay here. And again, without getting in the weeds, one of them is mold and dyes. That Thailand's producing cars forever. A dye and a mold is something where if you're making a part of a body, you can stamp the metal and you can make those molds. It's not, it's not very high tech. They import it all. Why is that the case, right? So I think you can look at particular areas where they do have comparative advantage, where they haven't done well at all. But you still got to be good to do, to do even in those relatively low mid-tech things. But it, acknowledging the external. I, uh, so I just want to add on, on to this question, because I was also thinking about the same issue. I was thinking, you know, what are the cases other than the East Asian countries in the last 50 years that have actually escaped the mid-income track. Mm -hmm. um, if there's no other cases, then um, there's some, there are explanations that are particular to that context that may have proved your theory, right? Which is, you know, you have um, these East, East, Indian, uh, East Asian countries that have, uh, uh, on the one hand, they were, you know, they're um, escaping this trap within this uh, cycle uh, mm -hmm. of global expansion. Um, that they, you know, happen to capture, and and of course they were they economic, uh, economically protected, and uh, you know they were they were U.S. allies, and they mm -hmm. also had very strong kind right. of pressure from communist countries that make their politics. Uh, I mean, the, the kind of inequality issue um, um, much less uh, severe. Uh, so they were um, in a very good position to. To escape right. um, because they had their politics were less, ma uh, much less uh, fragmented when mm -hmm. they make that transition, right? right? Um, so whereas Thailand maybe it has already missed that opportunity of global expansion, now we are in a s you know systemic crisis according to uh, Wallerstein um, or Arigi, right? So that make it maybe um, structurally impossible for for countries like Thailand or e probably even China to ex to, to to escape that trap. Um, so, so I, guess I, that's I, kind I of think that's in, in, in many cases, so when you say structurally impossible, I would, I would interpret that as saying that the nature of the social fragmentation is such that unless there's a major shock to the system, um, nothing is going to happen, that they are in fact 
Well, there are cycles of, uh, of uh, this um, um, expansion and contraction. Well, the question is, what leads to the cycles? And so I yeah. think that you're, and this gets back to something that Dan and I and our colleague Brian Ritchie, um, you mentioned this kind of conditions of the East Asian Knicks, and our argument in that article, some of you may know it, was that they faced a particular set of circumstances, of pressures that led political elites to help craft these coalitions, right? And Thailand doesn't have that. Malaysia doesn't have that. So that simply addresses the question, under what conditions do you get the coalitions? Sometimes, it, again, I said sometimes it comes from the top, sometimes it comes from the bottom. Now, how can, I think one can look, so in that sense, one could argue that the East Asian Knicks are deviant cases. But what do you learn from deviant cases? This is a big methodological question. I think you can learn a lot. Right, that it happened in this set of things, and it's pretty deviant, but at least you can see what is required to do it. Now, I'm not clear if there's any other set of conditions where you can do that. And here, excuse me, one way of thinking about this is, are there any other exceptions beside the East Asian Knicks? And you guys raised that. So to me, I would look at subnational variation. So there the argument would be, um, even in Thailand, how did they develop an efficient rubber cultivation system to begin with? That was not foreordained. And they did it because of security threats from the British way back, right, and from Malaysia. The best example is Penang, right? So Penang is an outlier in terms of Malaysia. There have been problems, but in terms of the elect, there's a fairly decent set of indigenous Malaysian uh, firms in electronics in Penang and our argument is that there was a set of particular conditions having to do with the dominance of a Chinese party, that party being under tremendous pressure from the loss of an easy access to revenue and basically they said we got to be like Singapore. We're Singapore. We're Singapore and Malaysia and we're going to do the same thing and they did. Um, you can look at um, there's a lower, there's some lower tech, uh, there's a, if anybody's ever drank a Malbec wine, um, where did that come from? So a colleague of ours basically said, looked at it and said it came from one province, um, one state in Argentina, from Mendoza, but not San Juan. Why? And so what he did is trace the institutions that, that led to that. I think I, perf I personally think, and we have people who know China here, obviously, um, I think that some of this helps explain China, frankly. I think, I think that there's elements of this in terms of threats on the political elite, lack of natural resources uh, to, 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 um, to sustain industrialization. Um, so I think, I think that partly I think China is not a bad case, at least it's suggestive that this might work. But you had a second question, too. Um, thank you. Um, so the second question is on um, what you mean by institutions. Mm -hmm. um, how does the notion of disarticulation relate to democracy and democratic institutions? Um, so the challenges you describe, such as the lack of consensus, is kind of a key characteristic of democracies right. or quasi-democracies, especially quasi-democracies, um, some would argue. So what is the relationship between the kind of institutions you think are necessary, um, aka institutions that allow the formation of a pro-reform coalition, that push for education and vocational training, and democratic institutions that are also emerging um, in places like Thailand? Um, and if they, um, under certain conditions, are in conflict, then which should go first? Right, and so part of the issue is what's the relationship of these social cleavages mm -hmm. to the institutions, uh, to democratic or other kinds of political institutions? And um, I guess I'm going to, I would partly ask Dan what he thinks about this. Um, and I, I, uh, but also, it seems to me that lacking some degree of of interest, um, of cohesive interest articulation, it's hard to have a robust democracy, a sustained democracy. Um, because to, to me, political regimes and democracy is about how you organize collective action about around authority. 
And if, there's, if everything is so fragmented, it's hard to have collective action, and you have, and part of that fragmentation is inequality, how do you deal with those problems? Um, and to me, the, the, this is the big political risk of this stuff, is that it will, again, leads to populism and, and volatility. Populism typically contributes to economic volatility because of the nature of the, of the economic policies. Economic volatility leads to uncertainty. How do you deal with uncertainty? So that's my somewhat untutored. But Dan, what would you say? Good question. Dan Slater, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think the, I mean, I guess kind of points to what I was, part of what my reaction was to the, I'm trying to get there on the populism point. Yeah. Like when Matthew was sort of saying, what's the word that jumps out at you? I mean, I think to me, what just really, really jumps out is distribution. Like just the distributional impacts. because. The levels and just the different kinds of fragmentation that you're talking about are just, they just make your head spin, right? Because it's not even, I mean, just start with business and labor, right? Like who, how are you gonna get business and labor, even if they were coherent entities, to agree on what skills, you know, upgrading would look like, mm -hmm. right? And then you just think about starting to slice these things apart, and it just becomes totally prismatic, and it just becomes this, you know, unbelievably fragmented sort of, you know, mm -hmm. terrain that we're working with, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so where, where does that get us? And I think that the, the puzzle here, what's interesting is I think what populism does or claims to do and what I think authoritarianism also tries or claims to do is say, we're going to bring it all together. Mm -hmm. This is some way of bringing it all together. You know, and if you think about Thailand in, you know, in the wake of the Asian financial crisis, I mean, it's absolutely, it's economic nationalism and it's like, we're going to like, we're going to, Thailand is going to stand up and Thailand's not going to be pushed around and you get to a point where you have a populist in Thailand in Thaksin who actually wins like majority like support right so in a way so there's this there's this paradox in which populism both can heighten volatility but also is a, is a supposed is answer uh -huh. answer to volatility uh -huh. right um, but I just sort of wonder about the I mean what role nationalism plays in all of this because it seems to me that the only way you even think about something bringing it all together has got to speak in nationalist language in some ways. And that's, that's part of the China story too, right? I mean, China, for reasons that I don't think our theory totally explains, has got a real techno-nationalist like, dimension and drive to it, which the other cases we look at with similar resource you know, issues and like don't have, right? right? So, it, so populism is one way. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, I mean, so populism is one way you get to nationalism. Right, but it just right. does seem like, so right. to what degree should we be seeing economic nationalism is underpinning whether it's populism or other kinds of ways of, again, how do you bring this all together mm -hmm. in a context where, I mean, just, and just the level of the pace of, you add the level of complexity of actors and then the pace of change, and you just, I mean, you really makes your head blow up, right? Mm -hmm. And so then the, but then people aren't voting for this kind, they're voting for pretty simple stories, right, right that are gonna try to, Get us out of this, right? So this question of, okay, the link between the populist response and nationalism, is a, it's a really interesting one because I think it depends. And so if I look at the Southeast Asian cases, my sense is that the only place that you really see this kind of nas economic nationalism is Indonesia, partly for historical reasons, I mean, all this, this tradition of anti-colonial, anti-imperialist. Malaysia to some degree under Mahathir, to some degree. Um, I have not seen it in Thailand. I really haven't. Um, if anything, and you go look back in Thai history, there was a national re nationalist response, and it was a centralizing response in the face of, of colonial, being squeezed colonial. The only thing that I've seen, and I, I find this to be a really interesting uh, research topic, is when do you scan? So I haven't seen the Thais do this. I haven't seen the Malaysians much. I've seen all kinds of talk from Indonesia but in Indonesia, I've never, I actually have seen, if you look back to like family planning and, and, agri and the Green Revolution, there was nationalist aspects in Indonesia. Um, but I have not seen it in terms of technology policy. I haven't seen it in terms of certainly not much in Malaysia and little in Thailand. What I have seen is when things get bad, they start scanning. They look at models. They go overseas and they say, who can we be like? And to me, I'm not sure what you would interpret that as. I mean, it's a nationalist response, but more it's like, we gotta get out of this mess. So I find the question of who scans when 
to be an especially interesting indicator. So if you look at, you start with Meiji Restoration, some of you know that what they just sent people overseas and then they brought them back, right? I studied a whole thing about how they learned how to weld. How do you make a post office? How do you do this? How do you do that? And then they brought back. Conscious effort to absorb lessons. And they didn't say, well, we're going to do exactly what the Germans did. We're going to say, we're going to bring the German guys back for five years and then say goodbye. Um, Koreans did that. Taiwanese did that. I'm not, my impression, and, you know, and maybe you could address this, is um, how the Chinese do it. In part, I would assume, in part through experimentation, through this tradition of experimentation, which may be exaggerated, but I'm still struck by, I remember one of my best classes in graduate school was Chinese history, and in the, um, the May 4th movement, there was all this effort of, who should we, what should we do? We've overthrown the, 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 the imperial system, you know, we have supposedly a uh, Republic. I'm not sure if this was 1911 or 1919, I can't remember. Who did they bring to give them advice? John Dewey, pragmatism. And I remember reading the discussions. I mean, I thought, this is amazing. Why did they bring, I have never seen Thais ever think about doing that, right? And I know that the Koreans and Taiwans, they send people to Japan all the time. Not that they love the Japanese, but the question was, who do you learn from? And it was only after 1997 that you saw the ties send people out and say, oh, okay, we got a good textile industry. We'll, we'll learn from Italy. We're going to be the kitchen of the world. Uh, we're going to go to France. So they have, now Thailand has something called a food inopolis. It's the public-private thing. They're sending people to southern France. They're running scared and they're trying to learn. Is that nationalism? I think that there's the question of how of linking learning to nationalism is an interesting one. When does nationalism lead to learning? When doesn't? I just want that on the Indonesia point. Yeah, yeah. It's just that the there is nationalism, but it's literally called resource nationalism, uh -huh. right? And so it's a it's a good example of where you need the to the extent it's based on your natural resources. Right. It's not going to lead to these kind of these right. kinds of things. Question back there. I'd like to draw your attention to a context primarily out of uh, Southeast Asia and talk about the experience or use Turkey as a background to talk about the experience of a middle income trap. So you, you, you painted a picture where institutions are relatively um, weak and they can't really accomplish a lot simply because they can't come together around yeah. the table, they yeah. can't sit around the table. Um, and based on what also Dan said, um, in terms of with reference to the role of nationalism, but I want to think about it as more of an ideology question. Um, can we think about the experience of middle-income uh, trap countries in terms of not one coalition or not having a coalition, but rather having two coalitions where one really did certain things, and they want they were the ones who brought growth in the first place, uh -huh. like Brazil, Turkey, um, South Africa. These countries had represented a certain kind of coalition, mm -hmm. which obviously ended up in corruption mm -hmm. in all these cases. So the question is not, for me, is not that they did not have any institution or, or, or any social coalitions, but the type of coalitions they represent are different than the distributional coalitions that probably uh, Dan uh, mentioned. Mm -hmm. So. My, my, my suggestion at this point would be to think about, for instance, in terms of, I'm glad that, for instance, you mentioned about all this uh, talk from Thailand, which very much resonates with what people uh, in Turkey are talking about in terms of some of the stuff. How do we improve education? But you know what they did? They dr drastically changed education, but not to the direction that you want them right. to be, right. to, the, to an opposite direction. Right. So, it is true, it ends, this type of, I think, uh, coalition ends up in a trap, that I agree. But I also want to acknowledge the fact that they also represent some kind of coalition, mm -hmm. typically where politics has some primacy. Mm -hmm. Because they were the ones who created those coalitions, those business interests connected to those leaders, they represent something. Sure. So in that respect, I want to see, I want to sort of push you a little bit more on uh, on, on 
thinking institutions as, as contested sites rather than a, a, a empty space being has to be filled by mm -hmm. one actor. Mm -hmm. If, so, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, and so part of the question is that, and I, I think your point is well taken, is that there are coalitions for all kinds of stuff. The question is, and the, the, what, what, what I'm emphasizing here is, is there a coalition for uh, upgrading in this way? But there are certainly coalitions, and you could argue that there is a coalition in Thailand for citizenship education, right? That there's, there are groups of people that, that for a certain kind of education, right? But not for this. So the question that I want to focus on here is, is there a coalition for R&D? Is there a coalition for technical vocational education and training? The Turkey case, I think, is interesting because just uh, we've, I've been see, working, uh, seeing the work of, of a, a couple of Turkish scholars, and their argument is now is that there's, a, there's more investment in vocational training than you would have ever thought because small and medium-sized firms are largely Islamic and therefore part of the AKP coalition, and that the government has put money into, into that to, sat, to address those small and medium-sized firms. So in that case, kind of an unholy, you know, a, kind of a strange coalition, but that actually did lead to investment and training. But there's coalitions, but our argument here is that and by and large. Add one point, if, if, your, if your scenario is correct, and we ended up, let's say, investing a lot uh, in, in, in those uh, areas, then obviously labor productivity would go up, human capital would go up, then wages has to go up at some point. You can't really have more qualified skills and work for less. So the point, which goes back to the very beginning of your slide, which is that the, the wages went so high that really they can't be competitive anymore. So how do you reconcile? Right, and that's the, so that's the interesting lesson from Singapore, and that is in the late 70s, there was pressure to increase wages, they increased wages, and then the multinational said, we're gonna get out of here because you're not being productive. And that was the spur. So that's kind of a Lewis turning point, right? That worked in that case. Here, wages go up, but then there's not that much pressure. Uh, you can use contract labor, you can use migrant labor, you can keep wages down some, pretty much. You can still keep wages down, lower than productivity, certainly. Um, Joanne, you have a comment too? Well, thank you very much for sharing your fascinating um, research with us, and it really helped me to think through a, a recent comparative uh, project that I'm working on related to this. I wanted to ask for your thoughts on whether you uh, might have um, seen or uh, what are your thoughts on technological leapfrogging, uh, which is something I see a lot in my uh, recent research where I looked at uh, tech startups in Cambodia. Uh -huh. The, the media industry in Nigeria, uh -huh. uh, finance in India, where basically what happens is that you have, uh, you have these uh, pockets of economic activities that skip straight over manufacturing into yeah. services. Yeah. Um, and if you think about the middle income trap, this is, this is a model that's based on manufacturing, right? So it's Pretty about much. Yeah, moving up the value chain right. of manufacturing. But I, I see a lot of instances which I do not think are exceptions. I actually think they're very widespread, where you have developing countries because of technology and various other changes have been able to leapfrog in ways that was not possible in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, and I haven't quite wrapped my head about how to tell the story or explain it, but I think the relationship to the state and all of the things that you've talked about appears to be very different. So I see the government being absent mm -hmm. in these sectors. The government doesn't even know that they exist right. because I think our model of development is very manufacturing centric. The World Bank doesn't exist as well because again, the World Bank is very manufacturing centric. Um, so I think if we take seriously into account the possibilities for technological leapfrogging straight into services, then how does it you know, change our understanding of the middle income trap and, and the story that you, you've been, you're telling. Yeah, I guess there are two, I mean, uh, I don't, I think that that's an absolutely key question and you'll notice that one of the slides at the end was, okay, if you don't have this Lewis turning point and you don't, you're here, um, and Thailand actually, a number of these countries have, you know, quite good startups. Um, my question is, um, 
has to do with the developmental benefits of service-based growth. And I think the, the you know, one, one reaction is that if you have services, whether it's AI, whether it's robotics, right, if you link robotics to manufacturing, but it has to be linked somehow to com something with large, um, with large employment generation and skills, then it can work. But I think that's one of the major questions facing development today is what can you do with services in terms of employment, in terms of skills, in terms of sustained growth. Um, the argument in places like th in, in Southeast Asia is in a lot of cases there's entrepreneurialism not based on opportunity so much, which would be, but based on need. It's, there's plenty of people that go out and start businesses, but not as much because there's great opportunities. Now maybe you do see some of it. Um, I'm yet to be, uh, I see plenty of brilliant manufacturers in Southeast Asia. Well, not a lot, they're a minority, right? So my question would be twofold, is how prevalent are these? What are the conditions that they require? And then in terms of development, will they generate, uh, will they generate broad enough income and skills um, to make a difference developmentally? And that's the, that's, a real that's the challenge, I think. I want to make one other point here, and kind of seeing you makes me think about this, and that is some of this, um, way back I did some work on corruption in Thailand and the question was why did corruption seem to be okay and I think there's certain times at certain stages in development where corruption to get around the state actually works if you have certain kind of structures of corruption it's another example of it works here but it may not work in a subsequent stage we have one time for one last question So I was wondering about the role uh, of international financial institutions in uh, Thai economy, because you quote the World Bank quite a lot. So I'm wondering, uh, do they have any impact? What kind of impact? And uh, can they influence the country's kind of path through this middle income trap? Um, so one thing that, so notice that the, the world, I make a distinction between the operation guys and the research guys. And I think the research focus in the guys in the, in the World Bank are really quite good, really very good. Um, the operational guys are quite different, uh, is my impression. But some of the best work comes from these, these reports. But the operation guys, their incentives are give loans and make sure the loans get repaid. Do they have impact on this? I think the most, the most uh, impact I've ever seen is, in, um, is when there is the country's absolutely on the ropes and there's macroeconomic changes that have to be done. So I still think of Michel Kandesu standing over Suhardo basically and they had to eat crow, right? And, but typically that hasn't happened in Malaysia. It didn't happen after the crisis. And it certainly, um, it hasn't, it, it happened a little bit in Thailand in the 1980s, but more than anything I think that it, the advice built on what the demands were of the technocrats and neoclassical economists that they wanted to do anyway and that it, it reinforced those guys. But in terms of the kind of microeconomic and microinstitutional changes, apart from financial supervision, which is really quite important, so I don't want to negate that, I don't see them having much. There was a huge World Bank thing to to promote business associations in the 1980s, didn't do a whole lot. Um, I, I just don't. I'm. I just haven't seen the impact. But to say, given all we just learned in the last 90 minutes, you can imagine what it's like to spend six years with this guy. How much you can learn. Poor so, Dan. Like, oh, no. Poor so, Dan. No, thanks. <laughs> yeah, just learned. I did learn a lot. So again, thank you. Thanks a lot for your ideas.